Welcome to Lesson 14E, Aerodynamic Lift and Induced Drag. In this lesson, we'll discuss aerodynamic lift and how to model it. We'll discuss stall and the purpose of flaps on airplane wings. I'll talk about induced drag, its cause, and how to reduce it. And I'll do an example problem. First, let's consider two-dimensional airfoils. Consider an airfoil at angle of attack alpha. C is defined as the cord from the leading edge to the trailing edge. A boundary layer will grow along the surfaces and then extend into the wake. But at high Reynolds number, the boundary layer thickness is extremely small. So we can approximate the flow of the wing as irrotational. There are potential flow codes that can calculate the irrotational flow or potential flow around a body such as this. The problem is that the streamlines would look something like this where you have a stagnation point in the front and another one on the top of the airfoil near the back. The flow here is unphysical because a real flow could never make this sharp turn. This potential flow would also yield zero lift. Turns out that we can correct for this though. We use our method of superposition and superpose a line vortex at some point in the wing. This vortex must be clockwise. In other words, gamma has to be negative since positive gamma yields a counterclockwise vortex. If the magnitude of gamma is too small, we get a situation like this, but with the downstream stagnation point moving further towards the trailing edge. If the magnitude of gamma is too large, both stagnation points end up on the bottom surface. We get lots of lift, but again this flow is not physical around this sharp trailing edge. But if gamma is just right, the streamlines flow nice and straight off the trailing edge. It's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, too small, too large, and just right. This case gives a nice lift force. This condition in which the flow goes smoothly around the trailing edge is called the Cutta condition. Why does this give us lift? Since the vortex is spinning clockwise, it adds a higher speed on the top of the airfoil and a lower speed to the right on the bottom of the airfoil. Therefore, there's low pressure at the top and high pressure at the bottom, giving us lift. Of course, in real life, there are boundary layers, but it turns out that as long as the airfoil doesn't stall, in other words, as long as the boundary layer doesn't separate somewhere along this upper surface, it turns out that this type of potential flow calculation does extremely well in predicting the lift. Recall that CL is the lift coefficient, defined as FL over 1 half rho V squared A, where A is the planform area, which is the area looking from above, which is typically the cord times the distance into the page, and we're talking about two-dimensional airfoils here. So we're typically talking about per unit length. If we sketch CL as a function of alpha, our potential flow approximation becomes a straight line, and experimental data follow this line very nicely up to the maximum lift coefficient point beyond which we have airfoil stall. Beyond that point, FL goes down and FD goes up, so pilots usually try to avoid this region. Wing stall has been the source of many tragic accidents over the years. There are various designs of airfoils. A symmetric airfoil, as its name implies, is symmetric top to bottom and has a straight center line. Aerodynamicists say that this has no camber. If the center line of the airfoil is curved, this airfoil has non-zero camber. What's the purpose of camber? Well, as we've shown, an airfoil with no camber has a typical CL versus alpha curve like this, where CL max is typically about 1.5, and it occurs at around 15 degrees. As you might imagine, the camber gives this airfoil some lift, even when at zero angle of attack, since it angles the flow downward. So the curve might look more like this, a non-zero lift even at alpha equals zero, with a higher CL max, but depending on the design, it may stall at an earlier alpha. By the way, as I mentioned in a previous lesson, when you have stall, the irrotational or potential outer flow solution breaks down because of boundary layer separation. Another way to increase lift is to add flaps on an airplane wing. A flap is kind of a small airfoil on the trailing part of the airfoil that can pivot up and down. The flap is straight like this for cruising flight, 
which is at high speed and therefore provides sufficient lift to balance the airplane's weight at a steady altitude. The flap is down for takeoff and landing, where you're traveling at a much smaller speed, but you still must maintain enough lift to hold up the airplane. In fact, at takeoff, you need a little more than that so that the airplane can climb. The flap guides the air downward, providing additional lift. But since V is so much smaller, you need a much bigger CL to get the same FL. But as they say, there's no free lunch. It turns out that the drag coefficient also goes up in this configuration compared to the non-flapped case. You don't want more drag when you're cruising. When you're taking off, you need that lift. And that's why engines are at full throttle when taking off. And as the plane travels down the runway, it needs to reach a minimum speed to get enough lift with this CL. Remember that FL is one half row V squared CLA. So though A is a constant and CL goes up, V is much lower at takeoff, but it must be large enough to give the appropriate FL. When cruising, CL is smaller, but V is much bigger, so we can achieve FL at a much more moderate CL, and therefore less drag. Here are some plots from our textbook showing airfoils without any flaps and different kinds of flaps. The CL can increase significantly with the flaps, but as shown in this plot, these high lift coefficient flaps also produce a large drag coefficient. Now let's talk about three-dimensional wings and something called induced drag. Real airplane wings have finite span, not an infinite span as you would have in a 2D airfoil. Here I attempt to draw a finite span wing at some moderate angle of attack. As we stated previously, the pressure is high on the bottom surface and low on the top surface. When a wing is chopped off like this and becomes a 3D wing, the air wants to flow from high pressure to low pressure, so it forms a vortex that trails off the tip of the airfoil. The same thing happens on the other side, but the rotation is opposite. These vortices are called tip vortices, or trailing vortices. Directly behind the wing, the airflow is forced downward by these vortices. This downward flow is called downwash. Further away from the tips, we get the opposite effect, and it's called an upwash. By the way, these tip vortices or trailing vortices can last for a long time, and the low pressure inside condenses water vapor and can be seen sometimes for miles as contrails. Why are tip vortices undesirable? Well, they reduce lift somewhat. This disrupted flow causes the wing not to produce much lift near the tips. It also increases drag. The technical name is induced drag, which is the drag induced by the tip vortices and the wing lift. In my graduate class, I do lots of analysis of these tip vortices. The easiest way to think about how these vortices increase drag is that all this extra flow motion is wasting kinetic energy. That kinetic energy has to come from somewhere. It ultimately comes from the engine having to work harder to overcome the induced drag. These tip vortices persist for long distances. They've been the cause of numerous accidents, especially if a small airplane gets caught up in one of these fast rotating tip vortices from a large airplane. It can flip the small airplane right over. They cause airport congestion. That's the reason we have to sit in the airplane on the runway waiting to take off. If they took the planes off one after another, an airplane following directly behind another one could get into serious trouble because of these strong tip vortices. So the next time you're waiting to take off, and the captain says, We're cleared for takeoff, but you still sit there for another minute or two, be thankful. You don't want to get caught in a tip vortex. Here are some examples of trailing vortices. You can see how these streak lines wrap around each other and form these tip vortices. Here's an example of contrails, as I mentioned. You actually get condensation from the engines. There are four engines on this plane, but they quickly start spinning together, and eventually you always see two contrails from any airplane. Despite common belief, these are not smoke. They're condensed water vapor the tiny little water droplets that appear like clouds. Here's a really cool picture in our book of a crop duster airplane with a huge tip vortex visualized by colored smoke. Tip vortices aren't all bad. 
You sometimes see birds flying like this, where this bird takes advantage of the upwash from this bird's tip vortex. This bird therefore has to expend less energy to fly. That's why geese fly in V formation. Hey dude, do you know why one side of the V is always longer than the other? No, why? Because there's more geese on that side, dude. <laughs> Thank you for that important piece of information, Joe. Jet fighters often fly in similar formation, especially at air shows. Is there any way to reduce these tip vortices? Yes, there are a number of ways. We can taper the wings. Most wings don't have the same cord all the way out, but they taper towards a smaller cord at the tip. You still have a trailing vortex, but it's much less intense. You can also round off the tips. This makes the tip vortex spread out more. In terms of kinetic energy, you lose less kinetic energy and therefore have less drag. You can also add end plates or winglets, where you add some kind of end plate on the end of the wing, or you bend the wing up at the end. This is called a winglet. This is called an end plate. Sometimes you see fighter aircraft with missiles mounted on the wingtip. They serve the same function as the end plate or the winglets. In all these cases, we disrupt and weaken the tip vortices, thereby reducing induced drag. Physically, all of these kind of block the flow from going around from the high pressure to the low pressure zone. You'll always get some tip vortices, but again, they'll be larger in diameter and have less kinetic energy and therefore less induced drag. Here are some examples of winglets on a sailplane. If you've flown recently, you've probably flown on an airplane that has this kind of winglet. They're very popular because they save fuel by reducing drag. Sailplanes really need all the help they can get in reducing drag because they have no engine. Finally, birds have winglets. They fan out their tip feathers. Here's a bald eagle with fanned out wingtip feathers. We see that our creator designed these birds with the ability to control their wingtip feathers, not only to reduce drag, but also to help control their flight with fine adjustments. Finally, I'll do an example problem. Suppose we have a commercial passenger airplane taking off. We give the total mass, the total planform area of the wings, the air density, and the maximum lift coefficient. We're to calculate the minimum airplane speed to avoid stall while taking off. First we draw a free body diagram where there's a lift force and a weight, a thrust, and a drag force. At constant cruising speed, sigma f is zero. Therefore the lift force has to balance the weight and the thrust has to balance the drag. At takeoff, fl has to also be approximately w and just a little bit more than that so that the plane can accelerate upward but we'll just approximate FL equal W in this problem, where W is mg. As we mentioned previously, from the definition of CL, FL is one-half rho V squared CLA. So there are two ways to get the required lift. Either you fly at high speed, or you have a high CL at low speed. In this case, we're given a maximum CL, so we want to calculate the minimum speed V to achieve this required lift which is mg. We solve this for v and call it v min. We get the square root of 2 mg over rho cl max a. This is our answer in variables, and so we plug in the numbers. 2 times m times g divided by density, our given maximum cl, and our given planform area. I get 63.9 meters per second, which is about 230 kilometers per hour, or 143 miles per hour. This is the minimum takeoff speed. At any speed below this value, even with this maximum CL, our lift would be smaller than our weight and we'd never be able to take off. This is why runways are long. The planes need enough distance to accelerate up to this minimum speed. On aircraft carriers, they have to use a kind of slingshot mechanism and afterburners to achieve this minimum speed in a very short length. In winter, row increases. So the lift goes up if all else is the same. So it's easier to take off in the winter time. Of course, there's another problem in the winter. If ice builds up on the airplane wings, it disrupts the flow and can severely affect the lift coefficient. That's why they have to de-ice the plane before taking off in the winter.
So be patient next time you're waiting for them to de-ice your wings. As they say, it's better to be safe than sorry. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.